This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said, in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, help us prepare and wait this Advent. Help us not rush into the season, but take the time to reflect, prepare, and become moldable for the future you desire from us. Amen. So as I was praying with these texts this week, I was tired of talking about the end of the world. So I picked the Isaiah text. It really stood out to me. I could feel the author's anguish and frustration with God. He could remember in times past when God was present, when the Israelites saw the glory of God, when God showed up with a bang and was so easily visible. God's people were excited to be God's people, and the church as he knew it was thriving. But now, God seems distant to him. What he knew is falling apart, and the reality of God being loud and proud well, that ceases to exist. Does this sound familiar to anyone? When we read our Bible, there's greatness and there's depravity and not so greatness. This is Isaiah. This is 5,000 years ago remembering the glory days, wishing God would come back. There are seasons in the church. And what I find is that he isn't blaming other humans for the destruction of the church. He's blaming God. 
He is saying that because God has made God self-distant, the people have delved even greater into sin. It's God, it's your fault. If you were just here, then maybe we'd be scared a little more to do bad things. Since you're gone, we're just free range. We can't help ourselves. It's God's fault for leaving that we did all of these things. There's anger, there's frustration, and there, most importantly, the author is lamenting. As most of you all know, I have implemented the blue Christmas service in our Advent offerings. It's the Wednesday right before Christmas. If you haven't come to that, I encourage you to do so. It's a place where we can sit and lament. Christmas is all about hope and the birth of our Savior, and there's a lot of joy, sure. But there's also hurt and anger and frustration and sadness. All of us have lost people. And not having them around during the holidays hurts, especially if it's new. And not having a space to lament that reality. I think the church is doing a disservice if we don't provide that. We are not just about hope. We are about the whole human experience. I think Blue Christmas is a good first step into allowing lament. But on the whole, I don't think we do a good job. We always want to just say, keep going, keep going, keep pushing, keep pushing. God will show up. But the reality is the church is not how it used to be. Just like for the Isaiah text. It is not how it was. And the reality is it will never be like it was. That doesn't mean the church will never come back, but it will never be like it was. And that's sad. And that requires lament. For those of us who have stayed and continue to try and serve God with even more limited resources, the struggle is real. And I don't know if we've actually sat in that. God feels sometimes far away, doesn't he? That doesn't mean God's not there. But God can feel far away. And we're, we're called to sit in that. Not brush it aside and pretend that we don't feel that way. Sit in that. And it is only natural to feel anger and to be deeply saddened by the nature of the church and society. We saw how good it could be. And now it's on its way to not being there anymore. But there is a rich Jewish and Christian history of just sitting in the suckiness of life. If you read your Bible, there is a lot of anguish in the Bible. Why, God? There's a lot of that. There's a lot more of the why, God, did you do this to me than the thank you, God, for saving me. There's a lot more of that. So we, I just, I don't know if this is comforting, but this is not unique to the story of the Bible. We fit right in. But we are called to say, why, God? Why are you putting me in this suckiness of life right now? If you read the Bible, please do, you will find many passages where God's people are upset and angry. Can I say that again? If you read the Bible, you will find many passages where God's people are upset and angry. It is not a book filled with joy. It is a book filled with lament. 
There's joy in there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the resurrection is pretty awesome for us. I'm going to have to say. But leading up to that, it's struggle. And you will find people blaming God for the state of the world, questioning God's goodness and whether or not God even loves them. I want you all to know that it's okay to be mad at God. God has big shoulders. God can take it. I know sometimes we think that God will be mad at us if we like tell God how it really is, how we really feel. God already knows. You can say it. God can handle it. If God can handle the cross, God can handle our complaints. I want you to know that there is hope coming in this sermon, that it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, but I just want to emphasize to you all, do not allow yourselves to shove down your laments. Please feel them. And don't push them aside. Bring them to God. Blame God. Be angry with God. Ask God why. God wants a real, actual relationship with us. Not a fake one. Who did Jesus get most upset with when he was here on earth? The hypocrites. The ones who said everything was all fine and dandy and we're just going to, you know, look at how great I am. I'm wearing all this garb and, you know, everything's good, even when things aren't good. Be real. God would much rather us be an honest prostitute an honest liar than a fake religious person. Those who pretend to be good, who pretend to be holy, but are snakes in sheep's clothing, that is God's biggest frustration. not our individual sins. Be real. God does not want fake. Lamenting and being honest with ourselves and God is the first and most crucial step in moving forward, here it comes, into new hope and new possibilities. So there was also another great part in the Isaiah text where the author kind of reluctantly makes known that no matter how he feels, God is the potter and the clay. It's like, no matter how mad I can be at God, God's the one who made me. Dang it. I guess I'm going to have to listen to this God. So, here comes the Play-Doh. I want you all to take out your Play-Doh. Yeah, I just want you to squish it in your hands. Just feel how you can, like, easily mold that. Everybody got it out? Just stick your finger in there and just kind of pull it around. Okay. Why don't you just feel? Feel how easy you can mold that. Maybe make a shape. So, like, here. It looks like this. We're going to make a circle. I don't want any, any phallic comments or anything. <laughs> There's a circle. That was pretty easy, right? This is us as children, right? We're pretty moldable. Pretty moldable. Our adult people tell us to be a circle, and we're like, well, I'll do it, but I'm going to actually be a whole. But you know what? They kind of get there. You know, they're a little defiant. But, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming who they want to be. And then as we get older, what happens? 
We get used to this circle. We get used to being a circle. We don't really want to squish it anymore. We don't want to play with it anymore. The fact of not being a circle anymore, well, that just terrifies us. And what happens when you don't play with Play-Doh for a while? Dries out. It's stale. <coughs> How many of us are stale? How many of us haven't been molded in a while? I want you to pretend that God is the hand, is your hand. I want you to pretend that you are actually in Jesus' place. Are we willing to allow God to mold us? To squish us? To make us something, and then when that's done, squish us again? God is the potter, and we are the clay. Not the other way around. Are we, are we going to allow ourselves to be with life? <coughs> to be willing to be molded? Continuously molded? Because you've got to keep doing this, otherwise it'll dry out, right? Keep growing. Keep being shaped. <coughs> keep allowing God to squish you and make you something new, because otherwise you will dry out, <coughs> and God can no longer do it. Let God be the Father, and let yourself be the Son. Amen. <laughs>